Welcome to Behavior Grooves, the podcast that explores our human condition. I'm Kurt Nelson. And I'm Tim Houlihan. We talk with researchers and other interesting people to unlock the mysteries of our behavior by using a behavioral science lens. Have we mentioned to you that we've had a major side project for the last three years? Uh, you mean aside from the side project that Behavioral Grooves is and the side project that you've been working on with BrainShift? Uh, a- yeah, yeah, the other side project, Tim. I think <laughs> we mentioned it, in, but I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure if we m- told people about this. this well, okay. Little Let's- side project. Of the, the side project, years. the side project of the side project. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, let's share it with Groovers because it is a massive undertaking and it's really, really, really exciting to share it. Yes, it is. With our partner and fellow podcaster, Andy Luttrell at Opinion Science Podcast, we are launching a five part series on the history of behavioral economics. It's called <laughs> They Thought We Were Ridiculous. Did I say that right, Tom? Did I, think, I, did I, think, I say that with enough I think, bravada there? I I, I'm you, not quite sure. You know. Oh, man, you nailed it. That is Academy Award performance right there, Kurt. <laughs> and, and it's five episodes, and all five of those episodes will be dropping in your feed on February 26, 2024. So Kurt just used the term behavioral economics, which is a term that we don't use a lot around here. And maybe we should unpack it briefly. Ooh, good call, Mr. Houlihan. Good call. So behavioral economics literally combines the disciplines of psychology, yay, and economics. Hey, I have I have an undergrad in economics and a PhD in psychology. Yeah, I, was I, can say. That. I can I can say which one is more exciting, at least to me. Anyway, right. it's simply bringing a behavioral psychology lens to economic decision-making. Yeah, but you know, the term that Kurt and I use most is behavioral science, because behavioral science is more than just economic decision-making. It's also about like all the anthropological and neuroscientific and sociological influences on our behavior, including the psychological and economic influences. So behavioral science tends to be more all-encompassing than behavioral economics. And that's a good point. However, behavioral economics is what got this story going. And it was the work of some very radical pioneers that gave birth to a field that classical economists thought was just bunk, or at best, a bunch of anomalies. Yeah. The tension was so great that the psychologists in the early days of behavioral economics, they were being shunned by the economists. So the the series uh, title is They Thought We Were Ridiculous, and it came from a comment that Daniel Kahneman made to us when we spoke to him. He said that the economists thought they were ridiculous, crazy, off their rockers. I I might be paraphrasing. Yeah. (laughs) And of course, if they had been talking about us, that was true, but but, but that's their, their pioneering work of, of these folks that we, we outline and we talk with many of them that led to the frames that we use in the world today. We talk about the attribution bias in places from boardrooms to halls of governance, and we do it as if we've been talking about that way forever. We talk about loss aversion, like it's just been part of uh, you know, the, the, the entire lives of in the history of the world, uh, or sunk cost fallacy or confirmation bias. But we do now know that we use those terms because of these rebels. Ooh, that was that was profound. Um, okay, so <laughs> we hope that you'll check out our five part series on the history of behavioral economics starting on February twenty sixth. Yes, and it was profound because you wrote it that way, Tim. That's all. I have to say. <laughs> there you go. Okay, let's talk about our guest, who is a contributor to the legacy of what we now think about as behavioral science. Yeah, Elspeth Kirkman is a brilliant thinker and writer in the behavioral science community. Her work with Michael Halsworth was one of our favorite books on bringing behavioral science into the world of practitioners. There's a link to it in the show notes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, actually. Thank you. Yes. But Elspeth has a new book that we wanted to discuss with her. So we got to sit down and have a fascinating conversation that starts with a discussion about what a decisionscape is and what are the four pillars of what make a decisionscape. 
Yeah, we, that we spend a fair amount of time on perspectives and how perspective can't be disentangled from language and culture all that easily. It's, and it's not only intellectually fascinating, but it also hints at some real world issues that spring from the way that we talk about things. For instance, if we use an active versus a passive voice, this was a really very cool part of the conversation. And also, we talked a little bit about some of Tim's passion for writing and recording his own songs. And I got to see Tim turn 20 shades of red during that part of the conversation. So listeners, just imagine Tim. Look at that picture that you see of him out there. And now just imagine the colors on Tim's face uh, turning bright, bright pink, and then red, and then almost some, I don't know, crimson color (laughs) As you listen to Elspeth give him some compliments. All I can say is thank God that this is just an audio podcast and not a video one. You know, we do have a, we do have video and uh, <laughs> we might just have to talk to the producer about getting that out there for people to see. There we go. All right. With that, Groovers, we hope that you pour yourself a large glass of Decisionscape and sit back and relax with our conversation with Elspeth Kirkman. Elspeth Kirkman, welcome back to Behavior Grooves. Thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure. Yeah, third time as a guest. This is pretty fantastic. So uh, let's let's get started. Now, the very first time that we talked to you, we discovered that decaf coffee was your preferred drink. Is it still your preferred drink, even after writing this book? I'm still on the wagon, yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, as I pick up my caffeinated coffee, I am, uh, I apologize. Uh, <laughs> here we go. Uh, all right. Second speed round question. True or false? Was your first paid job being a bartender? I'm going to say true, but also this happened last time where you asked me a question and I couldn't remember the exact answer, but yeah, I think that's true. <laughs> I mean, I have been a bartender. I'm pretty sure it was my first paid job, but am I counting babysitting? Okay. Who knows? Yeah, I guess I guess the the like real job where you you know didn't yeah. get the cash as you left the as as you left uh, you know getting out of the job. So cool. Yeah. When did where did you bartend? I bartended in quite a few different places. Uh, my longest bartending job was at was at university. So I used to work on the university um, bar, which was always fun. I always find I was a bartender for one summer. I find that uh, you learn a lot about people as a bartender. That was that was my insight. Yeah, I think that's true. Do you learn a lot of pe- about people like when they're drunk or like is, is it sort of the worst side of the human condition that you learn about? Or is it just I mean, you're not learning about whether they, you know, go to a car wash or wash their car at home. We, so. would, we would host a lot of. Um, so in the holidays, they would use the accommodation for conferences and we would host massive conferences that would be very, very boozy in the evenings. I think you'd learn a lot about corporate culture. So we had one organization that is a large burger chain, which is not Scottish, but sounds like it might be. Um, And uh, (laughs) they came and within, I think it was probably 35 minutes of them being in the bar, we were having to serve shots in pint glasses because we'd run out of all other glasses because they were drinking at such a fast pace. (laughs) And it was carnage. <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> that just sounds brutal. Okay, we we have to move on. We have to yes, move let's, on. Let's get to the third question in our speed round. Is it easier to write a book as a solo author or as a co-author? I'm going to go co-author. I think. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. Okay. Well, that, that's good, yeah. Tim. You yeah. can't you can't just throw me off of this writing writing our book together now because it was easier if you did it just by yourself. So there you go. I'm, I'm actually glad to hear that. Yes, <laughs> that's, that's good news. Well, you've had the experience of writing writing both ways, and so you know it's always an interesting thing to to are you. Is it easier because you have your own ideas and you can just go with it, or is it easier because you can share the burden and talk through things and kind of, you know, work through, what would you say is the reason that you said it was easier? I think, I mean, you're right, there's sort of trade-offs either way. I think for me, the main thing is it's a bit like what I imagine being a comedian writing jokes in your office is like, where you're sitting there sort of chuckling to yourself, and then you think, I've got no idea if this is actually (laughs) funny or not. And if you've got a co-author, at least you can kind of spitball and say, you know, is this interesting? I feel like I wrote a lot more things that didn't end up making it 
writing by myself than I did knowing that my co-author was going to be my accountability buddy reading it and going, what in the tangent have you written here? <laughs> um, so there's that. But then also the sort of freedom, the freedom to be chaotic has to be reined in a bit when you're writing with somebody else. So I feel like with this, I dotted around a lot more on today. I fancy writing about, you know, a topic three quarters of the way through the book today. I fancy writing the introduction. Whereas when you're writing together, you have to be a little bit more oh, structured. Oh, I like that. All right. Cool. Last speed round question, Elspeth, which is a bigger challenge when it comes to making good decision, lack of knowledge or lack of perspective? I'm going to go with lack of perspective. I don't think people generally make decisions that they regret because they didn't have all the information available. Maybe they do sometimes, but a lot of the time not. So we're talking about your new book, Decisionscape, The Art of Getting Perspective. So let's just start with the title. What is a decisionscape? So I'm a huge fan of metaphors and then torturing them. So it's... Uh, <laughs> It's a little bit of a product of that. Basically, the book is about how we form our perspectives, how those perspectives get distorted, and what we can do about it when they do, with the idea that perspective informs you know, how you feel, how you make decisions, what happens as a result of, of that. And so I kind of landed, I tried out quite a few different analogies or ways of thinking about this, and I landed on one which is, if you were an artist constructing a kind of simulation of reality on a canvas. There are specific ways that you would, you know, specific techniques, formulas that you would use to go about constructing uh, the perspective that you're trying to create. And we can learn quite a lot from the way that an artist goes about creating perspective, you know, everything from the decisions they make about what to centre and foreground through to the context that they're working in and, and many other things. And so the decision scape is almost this idea of uh, if you imagine that your perspective is something that you could sketch out and it is something where all of the different factors that influence it are kind of objects that can be moved about, resized, uh, excluded, included uh, within the frame, then, um, you know, how might you conceptualise that and how might it help you to to think better and differently about your predicaments? What was the impetus? What What got you thinking about perspective and what got you thinking about, all right, now that I've been thinking about this, I need to write a book about this? just um, pure ego. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think um, the, 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 this, the, the sort of nascence of this was, it was a, quite a long time in, in gestation, uh, if you will. So in around, I think probably 2015, uh, I was doing a couple of projects and I kind of noticed both projects were um, on social work and I was doing a bunch of work in education. So I was talking to people that worked on the front line of those professions, social workers and teachers, and also people that work in central government sort of setting the policy around around those things. And I noticed, I mean not something particularly novel that anyone would be terribly surprised by, but social workers and teachers were leaving the profession at very high rates. They were burning out. And a lot of the time when you talk to them about why that was happening, it was because everything was just, it just felt overwhelming and unbearable. And like every, uh, there's a bit in the book where I talk about this particular quote from a social worker where she's saying, it's just everything in my face all the time. And there's this sort of very interesting sense of you feel like you can't do anything because everything is just too big and looms too large. And then at the other end of it, you have people that are setting the policies who also want the best kind of outcomes. But they're so kind of distant and removed from the actual work that what they're really doing day to day is they're often, you know, changing numbers and spreadsheets. And those things have massive ripple effects on how much funding is available through the system. And the things that are kind of looming large at the front of their mind are, you know, what's the minister breathing down my neck going to say in uh, their next speech? Or, you know, how do I make sure that I get this done by the statutory deadline or whatever it might be. They're sort of, you know, working on the same problem, but their perspectives on it are completely different. And that leads to a completely different set of stresses and a completely different set of reasons that people are feeling burned out in the job. And then while I was kind of thinking about that, I kept thinking about this analogy of um, trying to open a door. This is quite like sophomoric because it's showing my very low level understanding of physics and me being like, I have taken an equation from physics and will now try and apply it to decision making. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, it's basically the sort of leverage or, or talk idea of if you try and open a door from near the hinge, it's going to be really hard work. You're going to have to pull very hard because 
the distance from the pivot is not is not sufficient to to get the leverage. And if you open it from nearer the handle, then it moves very very easily. And it almost th- these sort of systems of social workers and teachers burning out when the problem's too close up was almost like they get this sort of decision fatigue and they can't make they get hung up on the decisions that they're making rightly because they're big decisions, but because everything feels too close and it feels too heavy. And then you get people that are sort of you know the click of a mouse cascading accidental chaos through an entire system and that's like you know the door is too easy to move you're too close to the handle so that's kind of where it where it began and then you know it must have just been sitting in my consciousness I had a few conversations with I had a great conversation with Kate Kate Glazebrook who's a good friend who encouraged me to take the idea seriously and think more about it um and then it it sort of rested for a few years and then it it resurrected and turned into into decisionscape well i'm glad that you didn't write a book that was metaphorically that used physics as the metaphor let's just say that i'm 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 happy about that i tried i tried really hard but i couldn't get it to work (laughs) but on on one level i think that there's something slightly counterintuitive i don't think that we tend to think, at least in the common vernacular, of uh, artists being sort of good decision makers or making good decisions. We tend to think of artists as sort of being creative, and creative sort of goes along with irrationality, whereas we tend to think of good decisions as being rational and more hardcore and more scientific. And uh, first of all, so kudos to you for making it work beautifully, actually. I think that it's really cool. But there's this sort of this part of me, like, how did you land on art as the, you know, as the, the catalyst? Was, was it possibly that 45,500-year-old ancient art that you opened the book with from, you know, from Indonesia, I think it was? Uh, it was, was that sort of the, the cornerstone for it? I think it was, it was one of those sort of happy accidents where I obviously had the idea swirling around my brain. And then I was reading something completely different about how we kind of quote unquote discovered linear perspective. Um, so, you know, an eight year old can probably draw a pretty good version of some railway tracks receding into the distance. And, uh, it's extremely simple, but it looks like it's, you know, it gives the illusion of depth on the page, but we really took a very, very long time to get there. So, uh, you know, the very old, um, cave art that you're, you're, you're sort of referencing really just shows that we have been trying to draw the world around us in a sort of semi-high fidelity way for since Neanderthals were still walking around alongside us. But it took until the Renaissance, the Italian Renaissance, for us to actually kind of crack the code of how do you create a realistic illusion of depth on the page? And it's just really interesting. There's a whole bunch of reasons why it took so long, some of which are, you know, what people thought art was for. Nobody was really kind of rewarding rewarding artists for being hyper-realistic some of it was about kind of failing to translate things that mathematicians had known. You know, even the ancient Greeks had pretty much codified the maths that you would need or the geometry that you'd need to to figure out how to do linear perspective. And and yeah, I just found it really fascinating that this thing that is now so prevalent and so pervasive and so well understood as a convention of art and a convention of the way that we represent the world around us just wasn't unlocked for most of human history. And then, you know, once I was started thinking about that, I then started thinking about, well, you know, how do those sort of conventions of the way we think about the world and the way that we document it change the way that we perceive things, the way that we behave? And there's a really, you know, really interesting thing that I then came across, which is for a very long time, there was this sort of narrative that the code of linear perspective was cracked. It kind of coincided with the printing press being mainstreamed. It sort of took the world by storm and everybody started using it, except for in China, where the sort of story for a long time was they clearly just didn't get it. And it's really interesting because it's not that at all. So in a lot of Eastern art and Chinese art, that there's a different system of perspective, parallel projection that's typically deployed. And I won't kind of go into the technical details of it. Um, but parallel projection is also often used in kind of engineering drawings. So it allows you to see an awful lot more of something than you would be able to see if you were just trying to reflect what the human eye can pick up on. And basically, it's because Chinese artists were in a completely different mindset, saying, well, the purpose of art shouldn't be to recreate the world that we can all see around us. It should be to create this super realistic, kind of better than, uh, you know, perspective that's more elevated and greater than any individual person could possibly see. And so even the idea of perspective as something that is objective and fixed and somehow a kind of 
truthful description of the world is actually somewhat flawed. It's it's kind of an ideological choice as to how you how you use it. So help us relate perspective as it relates to art back into perspective as it relates to decision making. Yes, I'll try and uh, try and get myself out of the uh, out of the clouds now and into uh... <laughs> and just do it in a in a in a quick little yeah. couple minutes two, of two or, two or three work seconds. here on the behavior that you wrote a whole yeah. book about. There you go. Um, the uh, so that so so the way that I y- use this idea of linear perspective to structure the book is that I I take it as a metaphor and I take five aspects of linear perspective that an artist would whether consciously or not be thinking about when they construct a piece of work. And those five aspects really relate to how we make decisions. So the first is distance and diminution. So that is basically, I, I had a quote from, I don't know if, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the um, TV show Father Ted, Irish comedy, absolutely brilliant. Anyway, there's a bit in it where one of the priests is confused about whether a cow is small or whether it's far away. And there's this brilliant sort of sketch where he's trying to explain, he's saying small cow far away. And I was trying to, um, trying to work this in, but basically, I failed to work it in, but it's the idea that an artist would know how to correctly size something depending on how far away it was. And our brains often do not know how to correctly size things. They will often be like, this thing seems urgent and imminent and is overwhelming and uh, dominating all of my attention right now. Therefore, it must be absolutely massive and everything else must be so small that I should shove it so far in the background that it goes you know, beyond the horizon line and I, I can't even see it anymore. So the first section really deals with that, this idea of psychological distance and how we can use it to our advantage and how it kind of tends to fox and and trick us. Um, The second is related to that, which is viewpoint. So an artist will choose, you know, linear perspective only works really when you stand in exactly the right spot or it works best when you stand in exactly the right spot. The illusion is designed for a specific viewpoint. And so an artist will be very deliberately thinking, where should people stand to look at this? What should be centred? Where should the attention be drawn? And again, you can see that there are parallels in decision making. You know, my perspective and your perspective on something are different because we're, you know, literally standing in different places uh, looking at the same thing. And then the other parts are uh, composition. So the idea that when an artist is putting together something on a canvas, they are thinking about not just the individual objects that they're painting, but the way that they hang together as a composition. And often the total, the sort of sum of the parts is different from uh, if you were to just look at each of the individual, each of the individual pieces. And so sometimes when we kind of zoom out, we can see big patterns. And when we zoom in, we miss them. And sometimes those patterns might be um, helpful. Sometimes they might be complete nonsense and we get sort of tripped by them and, 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 and distracted. And then the last part is what I call the frame. So this is maybe the part that the artist is not consciously thinking about, but this is the idea that you know, work doesn't happen in a vacuum. People choose to represent things that are pertinent to the world that they're living in. And so what you're framing and what you're actually including and excluding, you know, also that's that's kind of a, a choice that is made before you even begin making making the decision, the kind of curating and narrowing of, of information around you. And we do that, again, probably not realising it, but we impose frames on our decision making that exclude options that are invisible to us. So that's, you know, that's that's how I attempt to draw the uh, draw the parallel by extending the metaphor for the whole book. Was there one part uh, or uh, one aspect, distance, viewpoint, composition, and frame, were, were any of those like, oh, man, this is the heart of it. Like, this is really the big bugaboo that we have to solve when it comes to decision making. Yeah, I think um, I think probably distance. Distance is certainly the one that's, it, it felt like it was the beating heart of the book as I was writing it. It felt like the one where it was the first one to emerge clearly in my mind. It was what I actually thought the book was going to be about in its entirety for quite a long time and it was only when I started writing you know it's almost like that's the trunk of the tree and the other things are uh, the kind of branches that that grow off it in in some ways and it was only having you know written enough of it I was able to stand back again perspective and say oh actually some of these things are not like the others this is the you know this is the trunk and these are the these are the sort of other pieces that that come off of that. So Elspeth I'm going to ask a question that you may not have an answer for because I don't even know if there is an answer for this. You mentioned just recently that, that you know, all right, so we 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 understood this new perspective drawing from the Renaissance. Uh, and then we thought, but the Chinese didn't adapt it. But it was they took the was it par- I, I yeah, can't parallel? I can't remember the, the, the term you used for projection. how they parallel. So 
the parallel projection versus the linear projection, right? And and when we look at that, is there a component? You said it was about how the artists were thinking about their art and what the art represented. But is there a larger component on, because when we think about how we make decisions, is there a larger perspective on how maybe the West makes decisions versus more of an Eastern thinking kind of decision element? And just wondering your thoughts on that, or if there's any connection that you know, and, and it may be something that that we haven't had a chance to even really look at. Yeah, I I do um, explore this a little bit, and I think you're exactly right that I guess the main point is that both of these forms of perspective, so a linear perspective projection and, and parallel projection, are products of the cultures that they come from, and they're not neutral. And the you know to take the kind of if if you do a very kind of caricatured version of Eastern and Western cultures or mindsets, it's not surprising that the Western version of perspective would be obsessively rational, completely kind of, you know, how do I very faithfully document exactly what I see in front of me? Highly individualistic. You know, it's all about what I can see as an individual and replicating that perspective and, uh, you know, rendering it in such a way that you can perfectly communicate what you and your hermetically sealed consciousness are are kind of experiencing. (laughs) And then from the Eastern perspective, it's all about elevation. And it's about saying, actually, the goal here is to have a viewpoint that's greater than anyone of us could possibly hold. It's almost like if you were to cobble together the viewpoints of lots of different sets of eyes looking at the looking at the same thing, then that's the the kind of net effect of it. Um, so I think it's absolutely it's absolutely that. And maybe, you know, maybe that's a little bit too uh, you know, it's not like it was deliberately done by design and maybe it's a little bit of an overstretch to say it's quite that stark. But I, I really do think those two traditions are reflected in the in the perspective projections that emerged. Yeah, we you you write about uh, language, and you write about how language influences our perspective and the way that we experience the world. Uh, you tell the story about Frederick the Second, the uh, was he the Prussian emperor, I think, uh, who decided to see what it would be like if children were not spoken to, so that they didn't hear any language, and would they automatically bring up like the the language of Eden or something crazy like that. Um, This is a really, really sad and horrible and cruel story. But it is, it certainly got the point across to me that language really does influence the way that we think about it. How do do you think language influences our decision-making? And if you'd like to editorialize on the the Frederick II story, you're welcome to do that as well. Well, the, the weirdest thing about the uh, the Frederick the Second story is that he's not the only person who's tried to do one of these language experiments. So I'm going to forget which King James it was, but one of the one of the Jameses in the sort of late 1400s also tried to do one of these in uh, in in Scotland. Same result. Turns out that babies don't thrive very well when you don't give them any. Um, uh, love language or attention. And the, the, the sort of answer of that one is kind of lost to history. But safe to say, I don't think they ended up speaking the kind of language of Eden that God has innately uh, innately bestowed upon us. I found this bit, this bit was really interesting <laughs> to write. So I'm a kind of a bit of an interloper in behavioral science and that my background is English literature originally. And I'm, I'm much more kind of uh, steeped in the humanities and then learned my science creds afterwards. So I, you know, I, I do kind of love anything that's to do with to do with language or to do with, you know, the sort of perpetually frustrated communication project of how on earth do we express ourselves clearly um, to other people when our experience is not their experience and we have a language that we all think we understand, but we're probably using it slightly differently. So this was really fun to write, but I also had to really check myself not to kind of uh, overclaim or to sort of find and cherry pick things in the literature that that supported this idea that, you know, the language we're taught to speak dramatically shapes the way that we see the world. And I think the the conclusion that I would come to on this is that it's probably not systematically true, uh, or certainly not in ways that we can observe, that if you separate language from culture, which it's very hard to do, that the language you speak you know, changes your behaviour across the board in large and meaningful ways. But it probably is true that specific uses of language and the way that we choose to uh, talk about particular things does, um, you know, does and can have quite a large effect. There's there's some research that I found really interesting, and I would love it if anybody's, um, if, if anybody knows of more research in this area or thinks it's an agenda that they would want to do more on, I would be super interested because 
it felt very undernourished and extremely interesting. So it's around the use of um, the passive voice versus the active voice, and particularly in legal settings. Mm -hmm. Um, and I found quite a few examples of law schools explicitly saying when they're training, you know, when they're training students saying, uh, use the passive voice when you're, for example, defending somebody and you want to remove them as far as you can from the, the kind of, from the, the scene of the crime. So by passive voice, uh, just to be really clear, I mean, um, if you were to say the crime was committed, that is the passive voice. If you were to say Tim committed the crime, that's the active voice. So I've removed Tim from the statement about the crime by by using the passive voice. Sorry, Tim. Um, not for removing you, for blaming you for the crime. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> well it, it's probably true. Yeah, yeah. So there you go. And, and Kurt's going to blame me regardless of, of who actually committed the crime. So <laughs> Yeah. Um, so there's a part of the literature that I was especially interested in, which is how the decision on whether to use passive or active language changes people's interpretation of a situation. So to be really clear, if I say um, Kurt committed the crime, then that is using the active voice. If I say the crime was committed, then that is using the passive voice and the benefit of but the we, passive we, voice. Yeah, we still know that Kurt committed the crime, though, don't we? I mean, <laughs> no, we can, we can add we can add by Kurt at the end, and also the you know the the camera the, the CCTV footage doesn't lie. But if I'm defending <laughs> Kurt in court, it, it, there is there's lots of guidance that I found from law schools saying I should say the crime was committed rather than Kurt committed the crime. I mean, I'd be a pretty pretty terrible defence lawyer if I was in court saying <laughs> Kurt committed the crime. But you understand the you understand the thrust. What I'm trying to do there is I'm trying to remove Kurt from the frame. And uh, it's interesting because it's not just a sort of intuition of law schools. There's research that backs this up. So the experiment asked, uh, it's a really, really elegant setup. It's a blank rectangle on a piece of paper. And participants get a red crayon and a blue crayon. And then they have a statement written above the rectangle. And the first version of that statement um, is written in the active voice. So it says red follows blue. So half the participants see that. And the second is the same description, but it's written in the passive voice, and it says blue is followed by red. So participants uh, are asked to colour in the empty rectangle using the red and blue crayons that they've got in a way that represents the description that they've read. So those who saw the active sentence, uh, so that's the one red follows blue, they typically covered more of the rectangle with red because red is active, it's right at the front of the sentence, uh, etc. So, you know, maybe they do 75% red and 25% blue. But those who see the passive sentence, blue is followed by red, they cover more of it with blue because blue is the, the thing that kind of looms large in that sentence. Um, so it's a really trivial example, but one that um, gives a really elegant demonstration, I think, of how the kind of manipulation of whether you use the passive or active voice uh, can operate. Um, so if a crime is described using the passive voice, so the woman was attacked, for instance, then people may be more likely to uh, either focus more on the woman's behaviour and what she maybe did uh, to attract uh, the crime, so kind of victim blaming, or they might be more likely to uh, kind of distance themselves, not, not think so much about the perpetrator. So I found that really fascinating. But again, you know, it's not systematically that because we're speaking English, we judge the case in a different way to people speaking German. It's the specific way that we talk about the case uh, might change what we think about it. That's it's it's fascinating when you you think about how language and the use of language impacts our decision making. And one of the things that just came into my head as you were talking about this is language evolves, right? The the language that I'm speaking right now here in 2024 is different probably even than uh, the way I was talking back in 1980s um, and was definitely different than how my parents were speaking in the 1950s. And with what you're saying is granted, that's not the language itself that is doing this, but some combination of that with culture and various different pieces. But does, does that imply that with the e evolution of language that our thinking is evolving in that same manner? Again, I know this is going beyond maybe some of the stuff in the book, but, it, you know, just your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think it's very, um, it's very hard to say, right? Because the, you know, language changes as culture change and culture changes as language change. Our behavior is attached to both of those things. So I think it's, you know, impossible to, to sort of definitively say, but allow me to speculate. I, uh, <laughs> I did do, I did do some, um, some work in the book on how we talk about 
difficult topics. There's a section on on euphemism and on the sort of different words that we deploy in order to avoid talking about the hard things. And what was interesting about that was that when I was researching it, there were so many examples from all across history of people often complaining about the use of euphemism. There's a kind of letter that Franz Kafka wrote when he was dying in an infirmary about how annoying it was that he never learned anything about his condition because people only ever used euphemisms. And and things from, you know, much longer, much longer before that. So there are these sort of enduring motifs or enduring ways that we use language, where you can imagine the specific euphemisms have probably changed a lot, but the device of the euphemism survives. And, you know, often we kind of have to find ways to overcome those. So one example that I use is how you talk about body parts. So we will do, I mean, we will go to such great lengths to avoid giving intimate body parts their actual biological names, anatomical names, for all kinds of reasons. And there's, you know, quite a lot of arguments that this does children in particular a bit of a disservice because it teaches them that they should be ashamed of certain body parts. It makes it kind of hard for them to talk about, you know, whether it's medical issues or, or, or something else that kind of makes them hard, uh, hard for them to describe what's going on. And yet we're really squeamish and we just can't get around it as a culture and say, for God's sake, can we just use the proper words? And so Sweden's approach to this, I really liked, was to say, okay, let's just invent a completely new word. So the particular problem was that they had a kind of a, a junior version of uh, the word penis for boys, but they didn't have one, an equivalent for girls. And so they just invented an equivalent for, for girls. And now it's just really widely used. They did a big TV campaign. They had um, little animated figures kind of singing this song. Very Swedish uh, in some ways, like, let's just be direct about it and get it done. Um, I kind of love it as this way of being like, well, culture and language aren't going to evolve to uh, to figure it out. So let's just let's just brute force it. I, I love that that part of the book, by the way. I think that 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 story resonated with me because it's always been silly to me how much we are concerned about uh, saying, um, oh, uh, that damn thing versus that darn thing. Or some some people in the um, in the area where I live will say darn like, oh, that darn thing. It's like. You you mean one thing? You mean to say that damn thing, and uh, but you're not saying that. You're you're not going to say penis. You're going to say Willie or Johnson or make up some silly word, you know. But you're we we know what you're talking about. Why not just why not just use the anatomical word? I I think that that fundamental aspect of who we are. It, first of all, I see it in every culture that I've ever visited, and, and which kind of slays me but i love what sweden did and said let's just scrap all of that and go with something different yeah i have a on, on swearing and curse words i i have a real real bugbear about it which is i just think that the reason we don't let people say them is because it's sort of it's kind of a tool of I mean, this is very over the top, but it's sort of language policing and it's oppressive. And if we just let people say it, we'd take all of the power out of those words and wouldn't have to get in all sorts of states about them. So I'm very, very relaxed on uh, on swearing in a way that I think uh, is probably not everybody's cup of tea. But it just I just think it, it makes me cross <laughs> in, the, in the same way that people say you shouldn't talk about you shouldn't talk about money or voting. I'm like, mm, yeah, maybe. But people who are told not to talk about money, it's often so they can't compare how much money and ask the rich person that's told them not to talk about it for, for more. <laughs> I, I'm in your camp, by the way, when it comes to uh, language. Uh, we have a fantastic language with lots and lots of words. Uh, let's use them all, you know, <laughs> and for various reasons. I was curious, you told a great story about, uh, and this kind of, uh, this was about your uh, taking the grade three musical exam when you were 14 and singing Whistle a Happy Tune from The King and I. Uh, so, I mean, you're you're quite the polyglot. I mean, you're law school, you're liter <laughs> literature, you're you're a vocalist, you're a behavioral scientist. Uh, you know, it's always it's always fun to talk to you. But I was kind of surprised to find out that it sounds like Rogers, uh, you know, Oscar Hammerstein that wrote the lyrics and the lyrics are uh, in, in this song. He says the the result of this deception is very strange to tell. For when I fool the people, I fool myself as well. It's such a lovely little behavioral science tip, you know, going on there. Um, did that, did, has that been with you 
since you were 14? Or was this like a recent discovery? Like, oh, he actually had a little behavioral science thing going on there. Yeah, I think the embodied anxiety of the grade three singing exam, and thank you for not asking me to, to do a rendition of it, has, <laughs> has, stayed, has stayed with me. Oh. I just remember the first time I heard about the Alison Woodbrook's karaoke uh, study. You know, let's let's see if we can get people to reframe their anxiety as as excitement because anxiety and excitement are essentially the same thing physiologically. And if they reframe it and say I'm super excited, and then they sing "Don't Stop Believing" uh, in front of the experimenter, it turns out they're <laughs> more tuneful and better at it than if they uh, focus on how how anxious they are. And it was when I heard that I was like, oh. Yeah, that's that's exactly like that song from The King and I, um, which obviously has stuck with me for for traumatic uh, singing exam reasons. <laughs> did did you, Tim? We're going to have to scrap having her uh, Elspeth sing. Take that that, oh, that question damn, out now. Damn. So there you go. Okay. Uh, yeah. um, how did you do? Did you did you pass? Uh, yeah, not not with any impressive distinctions or anything, but I, I scraped through. I remember getting to the sight reading and thinking, I don't really understand this, but I know that that one's up from that one, so... <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Elspeth, you and I on I, I can't read music for the for the life of me. And um, it's one of my big regrets in life. But man, it's uh, right. but but you are a songwriter. No, Kurt, you are. It, 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 whatever <laughs> there. We, we, we're going to keep focusing on Elspeth here. So if, if Elspeth, if you had to, uh, um, you know, if, if a reader picked up this book, what what do you want them to take away? What What is the couple things that you go, you know, if, if they just left after reading this book with a better understanding or, or insight on, what would that be? Oh, gosh, that's very difficult. I think, I mean, generally anything that helps people uh, structure introspection, I think is quite helpful. So anything that helps you kind of mm. have a framework for thinking about why am I doing the things I'm doing? Are they serving me well? And how might I do them differently? And so it's not meant to be a self-help book, but I would hope that people would be able to take away some, oh yeah, like I really relate to that. And, you know, there's lots of examples throughout of problems where perspective has been distorted and then hopefully paired with examples of where that type of problem has been uh, overcome and, you know, how you might design the the decision or the choice set differently next time. So I'd hope that um, that people might take that away. And then I think some of the bits towards the end around what are you cutting out of the frame without even realizing it. So what are the things that you're just not including in yeah. your decision because you're not focusing on them? I think that's so hard for any of us to notice because you don't, you know, you're just steeped in what's normal to you. But I think it would be hugely valuable um, to all of us if we could kind of, you know, inch out the frame and just see the things that we're excluding that are adjacent to the reality we live in and um, grasp those possibilities. Yeah. I, I think that's that's fascinating because that that last part that you talked about was one of the things that I took. And it's like we do cut a lot out of the frame without even thinking about it. And and, and because it's out of the frame or as you even said before at the very beginning, where uh, whatever is in front of us becomes so big that everything else gets pushed behind the horizon that we can't see it. it those types of elements is it, it, if there is some introspection, as you said, that element of saying, can I broaden this frame? What, what am I missing? Because we don't do that. And I think it's a really important lesson and, and one of the things that I'm definitely taking out of this. So it, it also uh, gets me to ask, uh, in, in part because I've been reading Robert Sapolsky's Determined recently and all about the lack of free will. Introspection does, I, I couldn't agree with you more that introspection is something that seems to benefit the, the human condition, uh, more introspection in general can can be additive and can be really helpful. Are, do you think that there's just a group of people who just will never go there because of their gene pool and their DNA or the environment that they grew up in? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I do think there's a particular, uh, I, I think to what extent do you value introspection is probably a question that's highly predictive of lots of other things. Um, and I think some people, you know, people would probably have quite polarized answers on it. And whether that is, you know, that you need a distribution. I mean, it could, you know, it does seem, I'm totally speculating here, but it does seem like the kind of thing where it's not implausible that it would be 
kind of wired in from the get go, because I don't know that as a population that's trying to, you know, collectively keep a species alive, you do want everybody being a, oh, hang on, I need to just stop and check in with myself type all of the time. I don't think that's necessarily conducive to survival, but nor do you want everybody being a, I'm going to put the blinkers on and, you know, never engage my mind with anything other than the the, the thing in front of me. And then certainly, you know, I mean, I think we all know that there are environmental things that would encourage or discourage uh, those kinds of behaviours. And some of them will be that, you know, some people, frankly, don't have the time or bandwidth to be able to engage in those kinds of activities. They're, you know, just struggling to get from one minute to the next. And then, uh, you know, there might also be things around the way that you were raised and, you know, whether you were told to focus on, you know, tamp down the feelings and pretend they're not there and don't think about it versus feel everything and tell everyone all about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There, there's all that. I, I'm curious, when you were writing the book, did you have any playlists on? Did you listen to any music while you were writing? Um, so the, the thing I didn't say about writing the book is that the, the reason it kind of came to a head and I proposed I want to write this book was I think my equivalent of People talk about nesting when people are about to have a baby. And most people's version of nesting is, oh, I need to get the nursery ready or like do a deep clean. And mine was, oh, I'm going to sign up and write a book. So I think I basically got the agreement that the MIT press were going to support it maybe like two days before I had my second daughter. And then I wrote it while I was on maternity leave. And um, we had a lot of, uh, so I wasn't really listening to music while I was writing because I don't do that. But I was listening to a lot of music while I was doing sort of late night feeds with her. And uh, there was one song that was sort of, I played on repeat and Tim, that is your song, Another Orion, which I know you already know because I've messaged you about it many, many times, but it is such a beautiful song. And can I just encourage your listeners to go and check it out and uh, Tim's other stuff, because I think everybody knows that you are a musician and that that is a great passion of yours. But I wonder if everybody knows just how just how good you are. I think it's it's such a such a great song and we still listen to it. Um, we listen to that and uh, You'll Be In My Heart by Phil Collins from the Tarzan soundtrack when she's having a bath. So those are her bath songs now. <laughs> Elspeth, thank you. This is, I have never seen Tim turn quite so red quite so quickly. Uh, this was fantastic. He is, uh, he's still in blushing. Can you even talk nope. to him? <laughs> <laughs> I, I will agree with Elspeth, though, for those listeners who have not listened to any of my musically gifted co host music. Please do. It is fantastic and amazing. And he has some really great stuff out there. Okay. Thank you both. Um, uh, I want to get back to, to the musical questions for Elspeth. I think, I think in uh, your second time on the show, we were talking about uh, it was during the pandemic and we were asking about what what you might do. And you said, you know, the first thing I want to do when I when the pandemic ends is go to Mallorca. And uh, so I, I wanted to frame that as a musical question. If you uh, first of all, did, did you go? Uh, and the second, uh, if you had a year that you could go to Mallorca, a beautiful uh, island uh, paradise, uh, and you could take two musical artists catalogs with you, who what two catalogues would you take with you? Oh, very good. I mean, first of all, uh, it's it's you're nearly right. It's Menorca, which is the slightly oh, smaller uh, island oh. next next to it. No, it's fine. Everybody um, everybody always confuses them, and uh, it's it's they're both lovely. But Menorca is the one where my heart is. Um, so I did go uh, first time I went back. My sister got married there, so that was doubly special. And we've been back oh, been back nice. since. What would I take? Uh, I uh, <laughs> most of when I get my Spotify wrapped now, it's like you listen to four thousand and eighty hours of children's nursery rhymes. Um, <laughs> but when I'm not listening to that, so at the moment I'm really into. I think the genre is called Americana, and you probably like know the difference between Americana and country and all the other things. But I think that's what I'm into, and I'm particularly I'm listening to a lot of Lucinda Williams at the moment. Um, so I'd probably take uh, I would probably take her stuff, and then I said this on the first one, but I'm a big Smashing Pumpkins fan, and I got tickets to go see them in June. So I'm doing a lot of preparatory listening to all the things I've listened to a million times before. So I'll probably take them. 
No, I wouldn't actually take the Smashing Pumpkins, just their music. <laughs> just their, their catalog. Are, are they playing with Green Day? That in the States they're playing with Green Day. I think they might be playing I think they might be playing with Weezer, but I'm not hundred percent sure. Oh, okay. But all of them are having a little uh, you know, yeah. they've obviously run out of money, all of them, and they're all having a little resurgence. <laughs> <laughs> because concerts are the way that musicians are making money these days. There's no money in Spotify, and I will not continue to you know, editorialize on that. Uh, but so, uh, but uh, thank you, Elspeth. We we uh, appreciate all that that input. It is always a pleasure to see you and talk with you, and we are so excited about uh, your new book coming out. Um, thanks for being a guest on Behavioral Grooves. Thanks for having me. Welcome to our grooving session where Tim and I share ideas on what we learned from our discussion with Elspeth, have a free flowing conversation and groove on whatever else comes into our maybe not parallel perspective brains. Ooh, ooh. I would like to think that we might have parallel perspective brains, but we are both, you know, creatures of the Western world, Mr. Houlihan. Our epigenetic makeup is such that we are much more European than we are Asian. So. And as such, our culture has led us to look at things through a very me-focused worldview. Yeah. Is that what you, is that, is that, would that fit? Is that, is that right? Uh, sadly, yes. I mean, it, it, I feel apologetic about it because I think that as much as it has led to some good things, it also leads to a lot of troubled things. Yeah. Um, so and we, we're not going to get into that, but um, <laughs> we so, could. Why not? Why not? <laughs> why don't we just go down some like really controversial perspectives on world cultures and the <sighs> positives and negatives and which one should triumph in the end? Well, I mean, let me say this, that regardless of your worldview, it, it, regardless of the culture that you grew up in, whether it's a it's a collective or a more individual it's still there's still been war and famine and uh, you know <laughs> and corruption all that crap still happens regardless of the society that you live in so. damn it you're right i thought there was a utopia that if we just changed our the way that we looked at the world it would just all just change i wish yeah I wish. but maybe with with the decision scape that could help yeah so so first off decision scape interesting terminology i thought that was really fascinating what else was said like her thinking about how did she came up with that and all that different pieces so yeah i adore it i i just love this idea of well i love the idea that she used the artist as the and uh, uh, the artist's work as the metaphors right yeah. um and i thought that it was great that she talked about distance as this really key element that we need that in order to create a you know a painting or or anything, you've got to be thinking about the distance. You've got to be thinking about the distance that the the viewer is from the subject, and uh, and what the artist is from the things that he or she is painting. Yeah, and uh, and of course, it parallels perfectly with the psychological distance that we need to understand things. <laughs> right? I just the, that's fantastic. The analogies are great. So let's let's be, let's. Be, I want to get dig into distance, but before that, just to make sure that we kind of repeat this because I know it, sometimes we forget. I'm just talking about myself here. So the four decisionscape has like four key factors: distance, viewpoint. Right. That perspective. Mm -hmm. Right. Where we stand and what we look at is, you know, different from where we stand. Right. Composition. How do everything how do things hang together and frame. Right. The frame. And again, really yeah. good, interesting pieces uh, when we think about the metaphors that they bring up and how they influence how we think about things and the decisions that we make. So. Exactly. Exactly. And I, you know, she's got great examples uh, in the book about all the art that would act as metaphors here. But OK, so getting back to distance, because, <laughs> getting uh, back to distance, because yeah, that's, that's cool. a big one. Yeah. Yeah. That, that That's the big one. Like, um, I just think so much about the number of times in my life when I come to a new understanding of something with just more time and psychological distance between me and the event than 
with anything else. That oh. in, in the moment, it's so hard to process something for me clearly. And, um, and granted, I'm an N of one, but I think that other people experience this as well. Well, let's just make it an N of two because okay. <laughs> I am the same way. There's I, just looking back on this past week at a, you know, lots of different meetings and lots of different things. Some of them uh, emotional components, various different aspects within, mm. you know, people I'm working with and others. And you, you are in the moment and you're so close to something that you, as they like, as you know, that old analogy, you know, you can't see the forest from, from the trees, right? Exactly. exactly. And cause I'm staring right at the goddamn tree and it's right in front of me. And all I want to do is just chop that damn tree down. And, you know, I don't, necessarily take the bigger perspective with distance and distance as you said i think there's there's that physical distance that is really important like you can get away from those people and those situations physically mm -hmm. but then there's also the time distance which is very important from a psychological perspective is allowing yourself that time to reflect and to to put some space between you and that emotion that was there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well said. I, again, I could just wax, wax rhapsodic on, on that because I've just found it so interesting. I also just was reminded, uh, and Elspeth didn't speak to this exactly, but when she was talking about viewpoint, that uh, when Michelangelo uh, sculpted David, he made sure that David's shoulders and head were just a little bigger in the in the sculpted in the sculpted version of David, than in the actual human that he was using as a model, and because he knew that the statue was going to be standing on a pedestal, and the the viewers, the viewpoint of the people looking at it was going to be from down below, and we know that that especially with fixed point perspectives, things get smaller as they get farther away from us. So he accounted for that by expanding. Uh, David's shoulders and head a bit to make him look more sort of natural as if we were looking at him sort of from straight on, even when we're standing below him. And I thought that was really, really incredible. And it, it reinforced this idea that artists have made really, they've been really good decision makers for a lot of years that we could look to artists as being really damn good decision makers. That uh it's amazing when you think, and and how old was he when he did David? Wasn't he like 23, 24? I forget. He was anyway, youngest, he was young. yeah. It's amazing. But I, I do like that, that, that where you stand makes a difference in yeah. what you see. Yes. And, yes. Yes. and, and again, from that metaphor perspective, the viewpoint that you're taking from the history and culture and experiences that you've had and where you are literally, you know, sitting, are you in a uh, fancy hotel or are you in a rundown, you know, dilapidated, you know, shack? Yeah. Those, you know, the same decision point could be put in front of you and you'll make a different decision because of that. And I think it goes a long way when we start to think about how politics and how different people from rural and urban and how people from different parts of the country in the U.S., different parts of the world, their viewpoint is different. Yeah. That doesn't mean that what they're seeing is wrong. It just means that it's different than the viewpoint that you may be having. And there lies the crust. You know, yeah, well, I think you're getting to something that we're gonna have to talk more about, but the moralizing about your perspective is wrong just doesn't make any sense when we think about the the evidentiary the the scientific evidence. It just says that different people have different perspectives for good reasons. For really well, good reasons. Yeah. I mean, just everybody should be standing from where I'm standing because <laughs> that would be the right, right perspective. Right. And therefore, everything would be good. But, well, you know, that's not how it works. So. Well, it makes me think that basically to, to, uh, to play on Elspeth's metaphor, like we're going to sketch it, things out from our perspective and our own particular epigenetic and cultural code. Right. That we are going to move objects around to suit our narrative. Like our brains just do that. Like what I, I think about Dan Simons and Chris Shebri's work, right? Yeah. That 
that we we will pay attention to some things and not pay attention to other things to kind of suit our our brain's needs. For, for those of you who who don't know right off the top, he's talking about the invisible gorilla and the way that we focus in on certain things and not on other things and you can be focused in on one thing and not see a big gorilla walk into a big scene in a in a video clip and pound That's that it. gorilla's chest and you can just <laughs> ignore that because you're not focused on that and that I think is really important. So, yeah. So uh, we might even influence the colors. Like there's all the, the corn sweet illusion is a, is a great example. Uh, the corn sweet illusion helps remind us that we see colors differently in different contexts. Yeah. So, so all of this stuff just says, wow, we have to take, we have to take uh, viewpoint and composition and frame into consideration. But the best, the best and most important tool is distance, I think. Well, I, so, you know, I think they're all important, right? And so I know Fair enough. that's sad. Yes, distance. If I had to pick one of my beautiful babies, that would be the one. But, you know, there it is. The, the other really interesting piece that we talked about is, again, that perspective and culture and language and how they are all intertwined. And that culture matters. And this goes back to this piece that um, the idea of art and the Western form of art, which is very, has a very uh, European history background of linear perspective. Mm -hmm. From my viewpoint, I look out and I can see distance. And that's where David comes in and Michelangelo and looking at very individualistic view versus Chinese art, which had that parallel projections, this idea that uh -huh. There isn't a point of that there are multitude. You look at a canvas in the Chinese, in, in many Chinese um, paintings, very different than the perspective that is from a Western European perspective. Right. Because they're creating a world that is better, right? They're, they're artistically creating a world that's better than any one individual's perspective. Whereas yeah, I, the Europeans have a single individual perspective. The Chinese work is more reflective of their collective society. So they're taking multiple viewpoints into consideration. And that's just fascinating. Well, and, and better is a, a you know, a potentially. Yeah, it's pejorative. Yeah, yeah, it's pejorative. But, yeah. Yeah. But, I, but this I, I idea of, of multiple perspectives giving you a whole look at the forest as opposed to just a tree, you know, yeah. and that I think is really interesting. Um, you know, and, and the piece that, Elspeth said, right? And I'll, I'll try to quote, you know, so linear perspective, projection and parallel projection are products of the cultures that they come from. And they're not neutral. That I think is the interesting yeah. part is they are not neutral that you go, well, what does it matter? Well, it matters because it changes the way that things are represented and thus changes our ability to comprehend them um, from the different perspectives as well as then make decisions based upon those perspectives. Uh, of course, right? Our behaviors are going to be influenced by those perspectives in a, in a meaningful way. You know, that kind of led to this discussion about the evolution and how they, these things change over time. And, and you asked a great question. I absolutely love this question where you asked about, is our thinking evolving as our language evolves? And I was wondering if you'd given that any thought, if you had any perspective on that <laughs> yourself. Well, yeah, I think, I mean, again, as we think about this and kind of as Elspeth said, look, language impacts almost everything when we, we think about this. And so, yeah, if your language evolves, your thinking is going to evolve. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, as we said, it's like, it's not neutral. And yeah. yeah. This idea that we have to, again, the way that we talk, the words that we use, the structure of the sentences. Re remember, we were talking to uh, attention span, right? Oh, I'm forgetting the episode. We'll put it in the show notes. Okay. But this idea that the length of the sentences that we have been using over the course of the past couple centuries Sentences used to be long and elaborate and very much. And now the vast majority of writing that we our sentences have gotten much shorter. Well, that changes the way that we think, right? It changes the way that we process information. And thus it has a impact on how we 
make decisions. And that, I think, is really interesting. Again, if you look at this from a perspective and you had a perspective where you lived in a culture where there was long sentence structures and paragraphs as opposed to short, more precise, more concise word um, usage and that the sentences were maybe four or five words, six, seven words, as opposed to 20, 30, 40 words. Yeah. Changes. Yeah. Uh, so do you think that we're in a world where we should be thinking about changing the way we think about talking about money and voting, right? This was Elspeth's, uh, you know, question. Like, she's like, people are still nervous about talking about money and voting. And she's, she's advocating for, no, you know, just let's, let's talk about money and voting. Let's just put it out on the table. I don't know. My perspective has been like, no, we got to keep that quiet. <laughs> and so I have to change my perspective. I have to get out of my, the, the, the little room that I'm in and take a different room, walk it to a different side of the, the aisle and maybe look at something from that. So, okay. The third thing that, uh, that I think we should talk about here is this active versus passive voice, the, the red and blue crayon experiment. Red follows blue, Tim. Yeah. Or blue is followed by red. No, no. Red follows, <laughs> red follows blue. Captain active voice there. Huh? And um, it's not blue is followed by red. No, red follows blue, right? No, well, it's, it's interesting when you think fantastic. about that and you think about that again, it, it's the it's the framing perspective of the the world where ninety percent fat free versus ten percent fat, right? It shouldn't make a difference. It, but it does. does. It makes yeah. a huge difference. The red follows blue, or blue is followed by red, shouldn't make a difference. It does. It's the way that our brains, you know, process these things. And damn it, damn it, brain, why do you do that? You know. So the implications, like juries. You know, legal arguments are going to influence the way juries think about things. Now, is this a massive effect? I, I, probably not. But if there's 12 people on a jury and there's a third, you know, a 10 percent impact, one or two of those people might come away feeling differently, depending on the way the attorney's closing arguments framed their uh, their messages, whether it was an active voice or a or a passive voice. Right. And even you think about. Other politics, you think about uh, misinformation, you think about advertising, persuasion, <sighs> the work that you and I do of working with people around incentives and goals and motivation yes. and leadership. I mean, I do a lot of work with leaders in, in organizations and we talk about communication, this idea that the words that you choose and how you say them matter. And that's really important. And of course, you know, the biggest, the biggest thing on this. Yeah. Yeah. Magicians. Oh, <laughs> mentalists, <laughs> mentalists, magicians. I mean, come on, without this, we'd all be going, I saw you move that card and not, you know, like, you know, I, 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 you influenced me as to saying red versus saying blue because of the way that you framed the question. That's how you knew I was going to say that. There you go. Yeah. It's, it's fantastic, though. It, I, frankly, I, I can think of a thousand things that I get that I'm, you know, I fall prey to and it's entertaining. So <laughs> it really is. So just because I know that that's how it's working doesn't mean that it can't be entertaining. The problem gets to, as you said, uh, when leaders are not giving thought to the way that they frame things, or the, the, whether they're using an active or passive voice, depending on the situation. Or, you know, or when they are giving thought to that and abusing it, abusing right. it, and they're yeah. not looking at it from my perspective and being exactly <laughs> in line with where I'm standing and all my stuff. So there you go. Which leads to, I think, one of the, the biggest pieces of this, which is the aspect of should everyone be introspective? Of and course. Of course, the answer is yes. Yes. But what's the but? <laughs> Except if you're not born that way. <laughs> Except if your DNA and your epigenetic, you know, uh, discourse uh, over the generations and the household that you grew up in basically make you a non-empathetic person. It could happen. Well, but do do we want everyone to be introspective all of the time? <sighs> I think I, I I think yeah. You that that's a good question. And the answer is no. We we can't right. have people just just sitting around the battlefield 
or we can't have people in, uh, you know, leadership like in the, in the White House in the United States wondering, well, let's be let's be think thoughtful about this. You know, we just got bombed by some, you know, some bad actors. And let's just think about whether or not we should respond. No, actually, maybe we just need people who are going to be I mean, it's worth giving some serious consideration to <laughs> how you respond. But having some kind of response, we know from chaos theory is almost a necessity. All so. right. I, I was I was a little worried that you were using an analogy that I'm going, oh, my God, Tim, where like, I think you, we need to think about those things. We just can't we dwell do. on those. And I, I think there's an introspection piece that if we if are too introspective, we get caught in that analysis paralysis and you could get way too in yes. your own in your own head, mm -hmm. uh, in your own way taking in multitude of perspectives and sometimes we just have to act. And so, yes, introspection, those people who live their lives with, with no introspection, I, I marvel at them. I don't know how they do it. I, you, and they probably do at some point, but man, are some people I know that you just sit there and you're going, have you ever given like a deep thought about anything in the <laughs> world outside of like how to, you know, swing a bat to hit a ball, you know? I mean, I, I think there are some people that go through life in just this la-la world. And I, I, I think we need more of that in those people and probably less in others who are just so introspective that that just you, you can't do anything without finding fault of something that it's like, ugh, it's too much. So Well said. So the world needs both. Right? We need the, both, and we need, we need we all should have both within us, not just the world. Our each individual should have both. So. I would even argue that in the political world, that we need to have both conservative and liberal perspectives. Uh, no, now we we need Hell to have yeah. yeah right. We need discourse in in an honest and forthright way, but we need to have somebody pushing us forward and saying, "Look at all the ways that we could." progress if we did this. And at the same time, we need to have people who are like, well, do we need to change that government policy right now? Yeah. Like, is it like, is this really the best course of action to take? Because maybe what we have right now might be working. Well, we have, we have traditions, we have uh, elements that are important to the kind of shared meaning that we have and we we can't just throw all of those out i mean i in a club where we've had some massive changes and for some people those changes made it so they quit the club and you know i mean they were decisions that were made in best faith but again it's just interesting when we think about that because the the club that they were in is not the club that is today. And do yeah. they then belong? And, and this gets into politics and culture and communities. And are you changing so much that this is no longer for you? And there's, there's an aspect of that that we have to be aware of. So, yeah. 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 So I just want to say that I had a big takeaway from this book, and that was the question of, Am I looking at the world in the best way that serves me? Like, right. Are, this is the question we asked Elspeth, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think that that's, that's a really great thing to come away with in, in this book. I don't know. Kurt, did you have anything? Well, and I think she also talked about what, what could I change? So if, if I'm, how is, the, uh, if, if the way that I'm viewing or the perspective that I have on the world, that, distance is too close or too far, if I'm standing in the right spot, right? If I have the, you know, right pieces of kind of thinking about, you know, the perspective and active um, element, the composition, the frame, if those aren't serving me, what can I change? Yeah. Yeah. Not, not asking the world to change. What can I change? And I think that's really an important piece. So. Agreed. Agreed. That's a take, man. We've, We've ground this kind of to a fine piece powder. into the into yeah. a fine powder that you can now snort up your nose if you it's want. A great, to. <laughs> oh God. It was a great conversation with Elspeth, though. Yeah, it was. It was. But no. now I'm just using that analogy. You can snort up your nose and you get a contact high, right? And you're just like, there you go with all this information. All right, I, I'm pushing it. Okay, okay, <laughs> all right. We could talk about Elspeth and her work. All day, for that matter. Of course, for that matter, we could just talk to Elspeth all day. Well, that would be, well, that'd be great. She is just one of those remarkable people 
with lots of knowledge on lots of topics. And it's always a joy to, to have her as a guest. And of course, we would talk to her about this five-part podcast series on the history of behavioral economics called They Thought We Were Ridiculous, which is going to be released on February 26th. And I'm sure she would say to everybody that you should go out, download all five episodes and listen to them and check it out. Absolutely. So, and we want you to share those five episodes with your friends, neighbors, Amazon delivery people, anyone who has to make a decision at work. Maybe it's in marketing or product innovation or customer experience or I don't know, anything. Yeah. Having a bit of information about how we have come to consider things like loss aversion, standard stuff could be helpful in your job or at home. So who knows, right? And it's all, all really important. So, yeah. Um, I, I, this is just a kind of a personal pitch. Elspeth brought up another Orion in our discussion, and we're just going to close out this episode with it. So you don't have to go to Spotify to listen, but we're just going to close out the episode. So uh, we're going to tee that up. But with this, Groovers, we simply want to say that we hope you enjoyed our conversation with Elspeth and that you package up some of those decisionscape ideas and you use it this week to help you find your groove. Just a 